the common uh, lecture on, on compartment syndrome is the five P's, but I don't even talk about the five P's because they don't really pertain to pediatrics, okay? That's fine in the adult world, but the diagnosis and key in pediatrics are the three A's, which is agitation, anxiety, and analgesia, which means increasing requirements of analgesia, okay? The other diagnosis is not really even needed. And so I decided I'd put it up here to talk about it. So compartment pressure measuring. So does anybody know where the striker, oh, you guys are all muted. Fran, you have to unmute people. We have to talk. I don't like the Zoom lectures. Um, the <laughs> compartment pressure measures. Does anyone know where the striker uh, measuring device is for com uh, measuring compartment pressures? In Stacy's office. Is it really? No, it is not. Ah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, Fran, do you know? In the OR? And yeah, also where in the OR? No idea. Good, because even when you call the OR, no one knew. Really? Said, no, 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 it's in ortho. No, it's not in ortho. It is in the OR. It's in OR room six, which is the common uh, ortho room. And it's not just in OR room six. It's in the OR room six substerile room. So there's a ante room to room six where they have supplies and they have a striker device. The reason I bring this up is because we've always talked about this. I talked about when I worked in the ED, we talk about getting a striker needle. You don't need a striker needle. You don't need to measure compression, uh, compartment measurements. I've never, ever measured uh, compartment pressure uh, in 17 years of practicing in multiple ERs. You don't need to do it. The diagnosis can be made just on physical exam and you can go and do a fasciotomy without ever measuring the pressures. Now, I say, when would you use it? Well, so I ask people, oh yeah, it could be when you have a, a questionable one because the kid's not very, you can't get a good exam on the kid. So they're a little kid you can't get a good exam on. So now who is going to go and stick a needle in a little kid's compartments in four different compartments <laughs> who's not really good at talking to you and telling you, hey, you're not gonna get the, you're not gonna get a needle in a three-year-old's leg in four compartments and be able to, to move their leg around and measure, measure those compartment pressures. That's not gonna happen. Um, so I'll show you the video at the end if we have time. Uh, MRAP, uh, Emergency Medicine RAP, is actually a decent uh, educational resource. They have uh, a video on how to get your compartment pressures uh, in the arm and in the leg. Um, but you'll see if we have time to watch that, that you're not going to get that done on a little kid. So I stick to my three A's and my physical exam findings. All right. So now we get to the good part. So our cases, because I always like to teach by example, uh, case number one. So this is a two week old X 28 week preemie who was admitted to Bicho NICU initially for abdominal distension found to have meconium plugs on fluoro. She was doing well when she developed swelling in bilateral inner thighs. Uh, general surgery aspirated the fluid from the left thigh and it was sent for culture and it grew, group B strep. Uh, patient's thigh lesions then became pur purple with bullae. Patient was taken to the OR for planned debridement. So the patient noticed a notably was having progressively more need for pain medication the day prior to surgery. So what do you think is the problem that they needed more pain medicine? Do you think they needed more pain medicine for this guy? Somebody talk to me. No. Fran, no. no, it wasn't the leg, this part of the leg and the wound. It was the compartment syndrome that developed in the lower leg because of this compression from all the venous and lymphatic compression. Um, so we ended up doing a four compartment fasciotomy, which is an incision here, an incision on the other uh, lateral side that allows you to open all four, uh, release compression, uh, pressure in all four compartments. Uh, and we found the muscle to be pale. Um, unfortunately also we, the patient was, uh, was, um, uh, uh, we, 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 with the Bobi, we did actually get a little bit of movement in the muscle, so we thought there was a there was a chance that things would would still um, still recover. Um, 
what do you guys do? So now here's a here's a tr question. So you have a swollen leg, and you think they have compartment syndrome. What position do you put them in? Unmute yourselves. Can we make them unmute? Can I make them unmute? I'm gonna unmute. Um, no, I can't. Oh, Marie. Elevate the legs. No. No. no don't. Why, why would you elevate the leg? No, no. Unmute. No, just just uh, heart level. Right. So you don't elevate the leg, right? Because you're not actually trying to decrease that swelling. You want to, because what your problem is, is perfusion, right? You're not getting arterial perfusion. So you actually want to keep it at the heart level. You don't want to elevate it because then you're not getting perfusion. The pain and the death is from lack of perfusion. So you actually want to keep it. You don't want to keep that leg up. All right. You want to actually take the leg to the operating room is what you want to do. But so that was a trick question. <laughs> With or without the body. Yeah, with or without the body, to the operating room. We want to make that pretty. Our goal in plastic surgery is to make this pretty. All right, here we are to make it pretty. So uh, due to the compartment syndrome and poor venous return, we return to the NICU. Well, there's another reason I left out. Also, we uh, ended up transfusing this baby, their entire body weight in, uh, in blood because we, every time we, we would debride off this muscle here, it just bled like stink. So we stopped and took them to the NICU. And this is actually after enzymatic debridement. Um, but I let you, I, I chose this picture because it gives you a view. Here's the, fasci the other ones didn't have the fasciotomy in it. So you can see we had a fasciotomy. Uh, we covered it with methotel AG and just wrapped it. Um, and then we debrided this enzymatically. <clears throat> and what I used for enzymatic debridement historically was collagenase. Um, and it did help, but we did meta honey and collagenase. So we alternated meta honey and collagenase to debride. Um, all the, there was all this fibrinous slough still on that we couldn't get off in the operating room. So then we took it back um, and the Integra was placed. You see it right here. This is the Integra graft. Uh, a wound back was placed with very low suction uh, to facilitate venous and lymphatic flow. Uh, usually on neonates, we do maybe 50 millimeters of mercury, maybe 75 millimeters of mercury on the wound back. Uh, we ended up doing, I think, 25 for this one, just to make sure that we, we didn't compress those vessels anymore. Um, so that was what it looked like after Integra placement. And then got a split thickness skin graft from her back, uh, which had a 90% take right here. And then here she is at one year of age. Uh, she's cruising, able to walk with no limitations in the function of her knee or thigh. She probably will need, maybe, maybe not, a Z-plasty to release some of this scar, but it looks really, really good at a year out. Next, case number two. Uh -huh. This is the reason this patient, I mean, this is the, I think the impetus for, for this presentation was uh -huh. this young man. Uh, he's a 13-month-old male who was brought to uh, an outside hospital on June 22nd of this year and was given ceftriaxone and uh, clindamycin in D.C. With a, with a prescription for this wound of really unclear etiology. The, the mother's story that she gave to the ED and to the pediatrician and to the CHO changed. So some, one of the stories was that he was left with the dad and the dad left the house and the kid was found pinned, uh, leg pinned in the crib. Um, but we really don't know what caused this wound. Uh, so they presented the PCP on 625 and they had this uh, 7 by 5.5 rough square patch on, of red indurated skin. Uh, he then presented again on the 29th where the wound was observed to be progressed with concern for infection. It was, it was 50% larger and purple and the entire calf was hot and moderately tender to touch. The patient will not extend the knee and has this three to four centimeter oozing ulcer in the popliteal fossa with surrounding erythema. Uh, was transferred to, from the clinic to the ED up where they live in Northern California. They received Vanco and Ceftriaxone transferred to Bicho for a surgical wound evaluation and child abuse workup. Uh, at Bicho ED, the concern was that this patient had compartment syndrome. 
but the concern was that the patient had compartment syndrome, very long standing, considering how long it had been that they had this wound and this pain and this difficulty moving the leg. So uh, they were going to wait till the following morning to call us. So the patient was admitted to trauma. The plastics was consulted in the morning, was taken to the OR emergently for a fasciotomy. So they got a four compartment uh, fasciotomy. Now, some people try to do a one incision uh, fasciotomy, and I don't believe in that at all. So historically, you did uh, two incisions uh, to release all four compartments. Um, when we opened it up, the superficial compartment was uh, pink, not edematous appearing. However, the proximal portion of the deep compartment was pale yellow edematous muscle fibers. Uh, it was firm to palpation, firmer to palpation than expected. Um, there was intermingled pink muscle fibers that contracted with cautery. Uh, this is most likely a late finding of compartment syndrome. So the moon was debrided. Um, and then we put Integra on this as well. Uh, the split thickness graft, split thickness graft did not take completely. You can see this portion here. It, oops, sorry. This portion here did not take. Um, but now, after three months, the patient has regained sensation and movement in the lower leg. Uh, the only unfortunate part is they have developed an equinus injury and will require tendon transfer for that. But the moral of the story is that pediatrics don't follow the textbook. Uh, if you had called us in the middle of the night, we would have come in and released the compartments. So that hey. is the moral. Yes. Bob, one of the challenges too was this baby had really chubby legs. And so um, when touching them, they seem soft. Yeah. What so can we do about that? They soft, but they, they were concerned, right? They, they were concerned that there was compartment syndrome. You can, you, once again, you could grab the striker needle and test the compartments. If you, you know, if this kid, if you want to hold them down and, and put the needle in the compartments, go for it. There's no, there's, but if you had called plastic surgery, we would have taken it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, case number three. This is a four-year-old who's transferred to Beecho PICU from San Francisco General Hospital as a polytrauma with abdominal distension, free fluid in the abdomen, and a burn to the left hand. So this is a submergent injury. Uh, the older brother stuck the hand in hot water. And that's what you get. So she had a compartment, uh, compartment and carpal tunnel releases done on the day of arrival along with uh, the diagnostic lab. So we didn't bother to wait. We did a, a prophylactic fasciotomies to her, to her hand and did debridement and then went back and did Integra graft. Um, instead of doing a vac, we did a bolster dressing um, of the left hand. Uh, and then six days later, uh, then it was followed by a split thickness graft. Uh, I guess it was 14 days later total. So unfortunately, I, I let the, uh, St. Francis have her because this is the last picture I have. But apparently, this is all healed in beautifully. And she has very little scar, um, except for apparently right here and right here. But this all took and doesn't, it did not scar. Um, so I wanted to actually keep her, but because she got put in foster care in San Francisco, I let Sam, I let um, St. Francis have her. All right. And that is the end of the slides. And I have plenty of time, right? Yes, you do, about half hour. All right, excellent. I'm gonna go through some things. Let me go back to YouTube. Ah. Oh. Um, one sec, you, you guys, this thing is in my way. Hold on, let me move you out of my screen. Uh, now, when I share my screen, are you guys gonna hear the video too? We should, yes, but I'll, we'll, we'll find out. Can you hear? Turn it up a little bit, Rob. Turn it up a little bit? Oh, you know what? You're not hearing directly. It's not sharing the audio. One second. Screen sharing. 
Is there a process that is your computer sound? Look at that. We're going to show you how to Not check compartment yep. pressures. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Let's do this. Why don't you get Jason and this is Dr. You, you guys can hear that now? Yes. Excellent. Dr. Walid Hamoud. And we are going to show you how to check compartment pressures. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Let's do this. Why don't you get that all sterile and anesthetized? Oh, now we're going to yeah. do this sterile in three parts. First, we are going to show you how to set up and calibrate and use the striker intracompartmental pressure like monitor that. system. Then we're going to do a little bit of a review of the anatomic compartments and where to insert the needle for each compartment. And finally, we're just going to top it off with a little bit of rainbow sprinkles and do some pathophysiology right there at the end. All right, so uh, there's one thing you need to remember before you start, and that's the number 30. The number's 30. What's the number? 30. That's right. And that's because if the pressure in any compartment is above 30, that's bad. Also, if the delta pressure, which is the difference between the diastolic blood pressure and the compartment pressure, if the difference between those is less than uh, just so you know, I put that uh, the, in pediatrics, we actually don't look at the difference between diastolic and the compartment pressure because pediatrics uh, diastolic is much lower. We actually look at the difference between the MAP and the compartment pressure. Less than 30, also bad. Now, let's get started. To set it up, you have your sterile components, a 3cc sterile saline syringe. You have the it. chamber and you're going to connect them thusly. Now you're going to connect the needle to the other side. And the needle has a side port for measuring the pressures. And we're going to clear out the air in the chamber by injecting the saline into the chamber. No air bubbles are allowed. And you do this holding it at 45 degrees. And you may have to give it a little bit of a, an aggressive flick, like a subungual hematoma kind of flick. There. Easy peasy. Looks good. Now we're going to load this into our pressure monitor. So we'll open this chamber up and it should snap right in place. The drawer should close nice and easily. If it doesn't, then you need to readjust the angle of the phalange of your syringe. Let's turn it on. And to zero it, you're gonna hold it at the angle that you're gonna use to insert it into the patient. And you're gonna hit the button conveniently labeled zero. And you should get zero on the screen. Now we're ready to check our compartment pressure. So put on a fresh sterile glove, repalpate your landmarks, and go ahead and insert it into the compartment. You might feel a pop as you go through the fascia. Inject about 0.3 ml of saline, and now it should read your compartment pressure. You know you're in the right place because if you squeeze that compartment, you'll get a rise in the pressure. The pressure is over 30, so this is consistent with compartment syndrome, and I think he's going to need a fasciotomy. I'm sorry, sir. Well, how about now we review the anatomic compartments? The lower leg has four compartments that Dr. Hamoud has volunteered to help us demonstrate. For all of the compartments, you're gonna go at the imaginary cross-sectional line about one third the way down the tibia. For the anterior compartment, palpate the tibia and go one centimeter laterally. Insert the needle one to three centimeters deep and the pressure should rise with plantar flexion of the foot. For the lateral compartment, palpate the posterior border of the fibula and insert the needle just anterior to this, aiming right towards the fibula. Go about one centimeter deep and the pressure should rise with inversion of the foot. Aim for the deep posterior compartment by grabbing the medial border of the tibia on one side and the lateral border of the fibula on the other side. Insert the needle medially, aiming towards the posterior fibula and go about two to four centimeters in. The pressure should rise with extension of the toes. And finally, the superficial posterior compartment. Go three to five centimeters off midline and insert the needle two to four centimeters deep. The pressure will rise with dorsiflexion of the foot. 
The forearm has two main compartments, okay, arguably, maybe more, but two that we're gonna focus on, the common ones. And again, for both of these, you're going about one third the way down the forearm. For the volar compartment, position the patient like they're doing an arm curl, then have them oppose their thumb and small finger and flex against resistance. Track that palmaris longus tendon up and insert the needle just medial to this point, aiming towards the ulna. Go one to two centimeters deep and the pressure rises with extension of the wrist. To find the dorsal compartment, have the patient palm down and palpate the ulna. Go one centimeter towards the radius and insert the needle one to two centimeters deep. The pressure rises with flexion at the wrist. Did you get all that? I know it was a lot and we went kind of fast. So we're gonna do a little bit of a review of the clinical findings that you gotta know for compartment syndrome. And remember, there are five Ps. The first one is pain out of proportion. Then we've got paresthesia. We've got pallor, paresis, and pulse deficit. But the most important one- If you wait till there's a pulse deficit, you missed everything. So- you should follow the pain, maybe the pallor, and in a pediatrics, you're not going to really be able to, unless they're older kids, be able to tell you anything about paresthesias. Um, and I wouldn't even, this is also, uh, paresis is, is a late finding, so you should not be getting down here. Uh, and you certainly, a pulse deficit, you shouldn't be waiting until there's no pulse. And the one you're going to remember is pain out of proportion because that's the one you're usually going to see first before the other ones happen. The other thing that you got to remember is the number 30. That's 30 millimeters of mercury. A compartment pressure above 30 is very concerning. Or if that delta pressure narrows down so it's less than 30, then that's also really bad. Okay, we got this, right? We got it. Now you know what to do when you're under pressure. All right. One second. Okay. There we go. So um, now you know uh, how to do compartment pressure measurements. Once again, it's not uh, it's not uh, imperative uh, that you even get a compartment pressure. And you, but if you did, you, in pediatrics, you would want to do a MAP minus the compartment pressure, which if it's less than 30 is concerning. Uh, compartment pressure over 30 is definitely concerning. And um, that kind of covers it as far as um, pediatric compartment syndrome. Uh, I'd love to start opening it up to questions and talk. So Brand. go ahead and unmute yourself. If you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask him directly. So are the ED residents allowed to do the compartment measurements? Um, why wouldn't they be able to? Well, do they know how? Well, that's why I just taught you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know if the ED residents know how. I mean, they, that's why you guys always have an attending there. So. Certainly, I think if you're concerned about compartment syndrome and the patient needs to go to the operating room, the attending should be involved. I don't know that, is this in our nursing um, uh, purview to actually do it or is it just to no, notify the MD? You don't, you're not gonna, as a nurse, do it necessarily, but you certainly are gonna now, all of you who work at CHO, I mean, look at CHO, you're there all the time. You're not a visiting resident from Highland. You're not a resident from CHO that changes every, three years, you're there. Now you know where the striker uh, device is, right? Who's going to who's gonna say, oh, uh, I don't know where it is because the OR nurses don't know where it is, except for Robin, the, the, the circulator for ortho. Now you guys know that where it is, right? So if it became something that you, it was uh, questionable whether they had compartment syndrome, which I still don't know if it's really questionable. It's usually pretty easy to make on a, a, on a physical exam finding. But if there was question and they wanted to do a uh, do it, you guys are the ones that are going to know where it is. I actually saw it done once, just with a transducer for uh, heart lines and central lines. This was way back when, but yeah, about twenty years ago, they actually just used the transducer to to measure. Yeah, I mean that's all that the that's all that the 
I think that the, the, the striker needle, and the, the nice thing about it, I think it's probably a little bit better because of that, uh, that side hole. But I mean, there's really nothing, all that, all that that device is doing is using the transducer that you would use for, for central pressures, the same transducer or, or art line. It's, it's the same, same, same exact mechanism that it's using. Right. So Rob, what about a patient who's transferred in, um, say, directly either to the ED as the case two was, or um, N3, or let's say they're transferred directly to the ICU and they've had already a partial compartment release? Yeah, I think you. I, yeah, I think you need to call. I think that the yeah that happens. It's happened from Highland not too long ago. Uh, you need to talk to. The, the, sur the ortho or plastic surgery, um, I think it's worth, I think that's probably worth getting uh, compartment pressures on because that was a case where they did a one incision uh, release, which is documented, but uh, they didn't release all four compartments in the leg. Um, and they, when they went back to the OR for, with ortho, they got, um, the, the, you know, another fasciotomy. Um, so I think it's worth calling uh, ortho or plastics uh, if there's, you know, they have had a, a one incision fasciotomy and they're still concerned. Do partial fasciotomies or partial release ever work? Are there yeah, ever really, any? I don't, I don't know that they work. I mean, I, I mean, people do, people claim to do a one incision fasciotomy that releases all four compartments. They claim that um, they they go in they go in they uh, elevate and they they say they can get all four compartments but historically it's always been uh, for the leg uh, two incisions for the forearm two incisions for the hand it's actually one two three four really five incisions mm -hmm. um, so yeah I, I think you need to do I, I, I the the classic uh, training you don't you're not going wrong with it right. Some people will say, well, it makes it harder to close later. I don't think so. Like if you have one, if you make one incision and there's so much swelling that it's going to be hard to close, how is it possibly not hard to close that one incision? So you're still going to end up graft having to do skin grafts to that one incision. So why not do both incisions and skin graft both sides? And of course, the risk is you have continued loss of perfusion to viable tissue. Right, exactly. So yes. that's yeah, so I don't think it, it, it behooves you to do a one incision fasciotomy. So just um, heightened alertness, if you ever hear partial, to be really watchful for any indication that it isn't as successful as anticipated. Yeah. And what about abdominal compartment syndrome? That's very different than a limb. Um, yeah, so abdominal compartment syndrome uh, is a laparotomy. Um, that, that is the treatment. Um, and oftentimes it's a laparotomy and you leave the abdomen open. So instead of, instead of closing, you either, some people will do, um, you know, packing and some people will do a, a abdominal wound back. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that the treatment is uh, a laparotomy. And it would be the same uh, measurements that we'd be concerned about. Um, that's a good question. No one, uh, you, you actually, there is a, uh, you can measure by bladder by Foley. So there's a, you can do the Foley bladder measurements. I don't know what they, they put the cutoff at, at because uh, every abdominal compartment I've ever seen went to the OR and got a laparotomy and didn't, didn't futz around with uh, measurements, just like I don't futz around with the, with the striker needle for the, the for the limbs, but um, I would I'd have to look it up. That's a good question. I'm not sure abdominal compartment. If you're looking at the same pressures, we we usually use it um, in the ICU to continually monitor and to provide reassurance that whether we do need to do anything with it or not. Um, and it's usually on kids that have like VOD or something. Um, that we continually to monitor to reassure that everything's okay. But if the numbers start creeping up at all, then yeah, it's almost always they go to the OR. Um, What's uh, what do you consider creeping up? 
I, I again, I have to look at the thing. I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Right? Um, I don't know. Hey, I don't know what a, a good cutoff. I don't know that there's probably good research on a cutoff. Um, there's a protocol for it um, as to how, how to follow and and when it tells you if you're like partially having problems or if you're in severe and things like that. Yeah. Um, most of the time, it's just it's reassurance that there is a problem there or there's not. And if there's any inkling that there is a problem, they just go to the OR. It's there's right. not much tolerance. Exactly. I mean, I, I, once again, you 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 have increasing pain, increasing analgesia requirements, anxiety, agitation, which you may not even have in the ICU because they're because they're uh, intubated and, and sedated, but you, you maybe you're needing more uh, increasing uh, whatever you're using, whether it be um, DEX or what for, for sedation. And then you turn around and you put your hand on their belly and it's getting you know firm and, and you, need, you have abdominal compartment syndrome and needs to go to OR for a laparotomy. Oh, that's a good picture. I, you know what? That reminds me, David. Now I should have brought, I can add to this lecture the, the case of the kid who did have abdominal compartment. Um, and it was just like this. There was no, you know, there was no uh, waiting for the Foley measurements. Uh, they went and got a, a fasciotomy for, um, they had, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, they had, um, a big belly. What's that? A big belly. Had a big belly. No, I was thinking it was a, a, a disease process. It was um, VOD. Yeah, no, they, but it was the. What's that? HUS. Yes, it had HUS. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, yeah. And so he, that kiddo got an op got a, a laparotomy and wound back to the abdomen. Yeah, anytime that we have a large belly, we start thinking about we should probably start measuring what's going on in their belly because uh, it's a compartment. And it just, especially if they already have a Foley, it's just something you add into their Foley uh, line and it's not a huge uh, inconvenience to nursing at all. Yeah, exactly, true. Should we anticipate the residents possibly using ultrasound to guide them to uh, put the probe in the right compartment? Sure, I mean, they can use ultrasound. I mean, everybody likes to use ultrasound nowadays. Um, you know, the, the, like the video shows, uh, when you, you, one, you feel a pop when you, and you get through the fascia. Uh, two, uh, you can, when you manipulate the, the, the foot, um, you should see those measurements changing accordingly on your striker needle. So. Um, I mean, the ultrasound can be used to, to help guide everything nowadays. So it's certainly not uh, unreasonable. I use it routinely to, to guide just to be on the safe side and, and do it faster, you know, instead of poking around. 